Now, the longest I waited for my pay was four months straight without receiving any money. Four months with no pay. <laughs> Most yachting agencies now use profiles on their websites uh, where you upload all your certificates, references, and contact details, etc. Now, if you want to know which certificate you need to get a job on a super yacht, I'm going to post a link to a video that I did a few years ago, which goes through all that information. I'm not going to do it in this video. One of the websites that I use to apply for jobs on will tell you how many people have applied for the job that you're, that you're applying for, which is kind of depressing. But what you've got to remember is if you're qualified for the job, then don't be disheartened because a lot of people who apply are not qualified for that job. So just ignore that if you see that. I'm also registered with a number of smaller agencies that will actually contact you when a job comes available that matches your skill set. So you don't even have to apply sometimes. They just contact you and say, are you interested in this job? Quick tip, I would recommend making your social media accounts private. That way the people who already follow you can see it, but nobody else can. And the reason why I say that is because when you apply for jobs, they will look up on social media to see what you're posting. And if you've got photographs of you being drunk or doing silly stuff, or if you've worked on a yacht already in the past and you've posted photos of that yacht on your social media, or you've posted where you are as you've traveled around, that's a red flag for any yacht. Even if you've never worked on a yacht, if you're traveling around Europe and you're posting everywhere you go, then they're gonna assume you're gonna to continue to do that when you work on board. And that's gonna be in your uh, NDA that you sign that you cannot post where the yacht is. So it's a red flag for them. They're gonna be concerned that you're gonna to want to continue posting. Now, I'm very private with my social media. I don't have a private social media. Yes, I'm a YouTuber. I've always maintained what the companies have wanted from me when I've worked on board the yacht. Anybody who's followed me a long time will know that I've never posted photographs of the yacht I work on or the locations that I am on board that yacht. And that's because the owner demands his privacy. And so should you. Now, speaking of privacy, I want to introduce you to this episode sponsor, Incogni. When you upload your CV, to a website, always use a unique email address. It's quite easy to do now. You can use like hide my email and, and create aliases and stuff like that. And the reason is it's very easy now to look up someone's personal data using a reverse lookup email search. And your data is stored online by data brokers who keep and sell your data to advertisers and worse. However, if you request it, they have to delete it, but only if you ask. And there are hundreds of these companies, most of whom you've never heard of. But this is where Incogni comes in. Incogni will do that work for you. After signing up, they found hundreds of data centers with my details on and immediately started asking for my data to be removed. These were companies I'd never even heard of and they had my data in their databases. Give Incogni a try if you value your privacy. Sign up with the link in the description for a special discount. When you read a job description on one of these websites, the job description will never tell you the name of the yacht. It will say something like this. 100 meter plus yacht is looking for a second engineer or a second officer, whatever job you're looking for. Must have valid certificates and up-to-date COC and up-to-date STCW uh, with experience in the following equipment. And then it will list the equipment that they want you to have knowledge of. Now, the up-to-date COC, that's a certificate of competency, that's your, uh, your license for if you're an engineer or if you're a deck officer. And the other stuff is like medicals and, um, and your STCW, which is your safety training for you know, swimming and, and uh, first aid and firefighting and stuff. It all has to be up-to-date. They're not gonna even entertain you if it's not up-to-date. Now, once you've applied for the job and you're lucky enough to be contacted, the first contact will probably be from a management company. Remember at this point in time, you don't still don't know the name of the boat. Uh, the management company or the agency that posted the advert, and they may ask for some specific details uh, and say that you've, you've contacted the boat and they're, they're following up on it and stuff like that, but they still won't tell you the name of the boat. Now the second contact usually will be from the yacht itself. And this is usually the first point you actually find out which yacht it is that you're applying for a job on. 
because the email address will come from the yacht, right? And the signature will tell you the yacht's name in it and stuff like that. So at that point, you're like, oh, okay, now I know the boat. And it might come from the captain or it may come from a department head. It just depends on the way the yacht runs things. Um, some yachts, the captain does all the recruiting and you won't have any contact. Like if you're an engineer, you won't have any contact with the engineering department. To me, uh, in my own experience, that's a bit of a red flag. If the captain recruits me and the engineering people don't contact me, kind of tell, kind of gives you a, an idea of how that boat is run. You know, the captain runs it from the top down. I'm captain of this boat. That's it! On a good boat, the captain and the chief engineer will work very close together. And so recruitment, he will say, well, that's up to you. On a, on a not so good boat, generally the captain will just recruit and send the person to the engineering department when they come on board. And that's not a good thing. Now, I'm not saying all boats are like that. I'm just saying that's in my experience. Uh, and then you wait after the interview process. But in my experience, it's never very long. Uh, only I have very limited experience of applying for jobs on land and it took months. In the yachting industry, in my own experience, it takes, it's very quick. Once you, once you make contact with a boat, it usually happens within a couple of weeks. And the reason why is because very often when the, per, when the boat has somebody on board who's, who quits, they usually quit when they're on leave. Now on a yacht, you have to give a month's notice generally when you leave a boat. So what they do is they go on leave for two months and then they wait a month and then they hand in the notice. And so they've got a month left on leave so they don't have to come back and work the notice. So all of a sudden, that leaves the boat scrambling to find a, re a replacement. This is why, in my experience, the yacht uh, recruitment process is quite fast. All right, so you get the email, so you say you have the job, uh, very exciting. Uh, things move very quickly from there. You'll hear from the purser on board and she, he, she will start sending you the details, uh, such as joining dates and flight information, You know, asking you which airport you wanna fly from, stuff like that. She'll also send you an employment contract to sign. Make sure you read it. Okay, so you fly out to wherever your boat is at that time and you join the boat. So what's your first day on board like? You'll meet the captain, meet the chief engineer, the crew, etc. You'll get shown around the boat and you will probably, that's the first day. On the second day, the first day where you are actually working, you'll do a safety brief. Um, with the safety officer, usually one of the second officers, they'll take you around the boat and they'll go through emergency procedures and muster stations and stuff like that. Obviously you'll get issued your uniform, usually on the first day when you arrive or the next morning, depending on what time you arrive on board. Um, and hopefully when you get your uniform, they will have everything that fits you. Now I've had many occasions where I didn't have items of uniform to fit because I'm quite tall and I'm not a 19 year old deckhand with a 28 inch waist. So um, it was quite a few times I've got there and they've had no shoes for me or they've had no shorts for me. Now, of course, you'll be shown to the lavish living area that you will have, namely your cabin. And it's not lavish, that's tongue in cheek, of course. And you will likely be sharing that with another crew member. If certainly if you're watching my video to find out what it's like to start your first day on board a yacht, you certainly won't be arriving there and having your own cabin. So you'll sign onto the boat, you'll sign the ship's papers uh, and you'll give your passport and your, and your uh, seaman's book over to the person and all your certificates and stuff like that. And they generally will keep those until you leave, usually until you go on leave. Now at this point, you'll give the purser your bank details also so that they can pay you. Most boats I've worked on, their pay has been quite straightforward. They pay you into a designated bank account the one that you give the person when you join, but they will pay you usually in euros. So if your home currency is in sterling or in another currency, then I'd recommend getting an account that can uh, that you can receive the money in the currency that they pay you in. Uh, you can get these online bank accounts where you can be paid very easily in euros and dollars and stuff. And then you can convert it within that account into your home country's currency. And the reason why I say to use them is because um, they give very good exchange rates, un unlike uh, mainstream banks, which give awful exchange rates. Now I've shown on the channel in the past, uh, the exchange rate uh, that high street banks give is quite shocking. I used to use HSBC and have my money you know, sent in euros and they would convert it themselves. And I was losing hundreds of euros each month because of the lousy exchange rate. And when I changed and, and started to do it, my, my actual salary went up hundreds of euros a month 
as a result of that. In my experience, most boats will pay on a set date each month. Uh, one of the boats I worked on for the longest paid us on the 25th of the, of the month. You know, sometimes it might be a day or two late, depending on what day that date fell on. If it was a Sunday, it might be the day after or the day before, something like that. Now, if there's gonna be a delay for any reason, the person will usually inform the crew, but it's generally rare to be late. However, there are some yachts I've worked on that have been absolutely awful paying the crew. Now, after working on a yacht that paid every month on the same date, I went to a yacht and I was told, you only usually get the pay for that month in the middle of the following month, uh, but never on the same date, which is really quite stressful uh, when you're, especially when you're starting in the industry because you, you count on that money every month, right? I've even worked on a yacht where nobody got paid for a couple of months and then when the owner arrived on board he had a suitcase full of money and he opened it and paid everybody out of this suitcase i'm sure that was all legitimate money of course uh, but years later i would work on a yacht that made that boat look like an ideal employer now on this new boat the pay would often be delayed by one or two months. So, so one month you would get paid on time and then the following month, nothing. And then the following month you get two months pay. So it was not brilliant, but it got worse after an overzealous crew member approached the owner complaining about the situation with the pay. He went right up to the owner himself when he was on board. You know, this is a big no-no on yachts. You, you never go up to the owner and talk to the owner about something to do with work. You're not to speak, you're not to think. To be honest, it's, it's nothing to do with the owner, um, how, you, how you get paid. I mean, the delays could be because he's not paying the management company in time. But as a result of this situation, the owner suggested to the management of the yacht that they should give everyone a bank account in his country and then pay them through that bank account to make it easier. Great, we can just put that into your retirement account and make it go to work for you and it's gone. Now, as everybody is terrified to talk to the owner about anything like this, you know, to say it's a bad idea, nobody wanted to tell him, uh, none of the management wanted to tell him. So this terrible idea was put into action. From a financial standpoint, you are now in heaven. See? It simply made another hurdle for the pay to go through before getting to our bank. So they created these bank accounts in this country, in our names, but they weren't really our bank accounts. We had no access to them. So what they did, the management did, is they, they would pay you uh, into this bank account. They'd have this automatic transfer set up to send it to your actual bank account every month. D don't worry, we can just transfer money from your account into a portfolio with your son and it's gone! So the money was going into this first account, but it wasn't being transferred to the second account because the bank had no currency and oh, it was a big mess. As a result of this, we weren't getting paid. Now, the longest I waited for my pay was four months straight without receiving any money. Four months with no pay. Everybody was in the same boat. Some, some people were waiting up to six months without being paid. Now, for me, I was, I was getting YouTube money the whole time, so it wasn't really an issue for me. I mean, it still sucked, but I wasn't in a situation like some of the crew where they were having to take out loans to pay bills and stuff like that. Please stand aside for people who actually have money with us. Next, please. Now, it would especially suck when you would see the owner buying a brand new car or a new speedboat or spending $3 million on the boat to put in a new jacuzzi or something like this, and we're not getting paid. So that really did suck. But I suspect that the owner had very little or no idea that this was actually going on because everyone was so terrified of the owner, right? You're on thin fucking ice, my pedigree chums. They probably told him everything was fine. Now the crew member who, who complained, he was fired. You are in demand now, Admiral Yet. Thank you, Lord Leader. So, you know, who's gonna say anything to him? Because that's what happens, right? If you, if you actually say anything, then you end up getting fired because the owner doesn't want to hear any of this. Now, this is the exception to the rule. I just wanted to tell you this story because it's an exceptional story. Most boats pay on time, in my experience. Now, as far as that yacht goes, I believe it is still going on. Still know some people on board and it's still happening. Now, the owner does watch the channel. So if you're watching, sort that out. It is a mess. Uh, pay your crew properly and you won't have so many people leaving.
will go on to leave. Now, if you're on rotation, your leave will come around and the person will arrange for you to leave at the next available port. This is how it works. Uh, you usually get your flight details a week or two before you leave. Now, usually your opposite, if you have one, you usually have someone coming in to replace you. They will fly into the port and you will hand over whilst in that port. Then you will fly home from there, wherever that may be. Now, if the boat is about to start a big crossing, such as across the Pacific or the Atlantic, then your and your rotation ends in the middle. Obviously, they can't, you can't leave in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So they will either rotate you out before the trip starts, which is unlikely. Most likely, it will happen after the trip starts. It just depends on where where your date falls. Let, let's say it's a 10 day crossing and you're, and you're right in the middle, you'll probably have to wait until the end. Now you could be in the Med or halfway around the world in French Polynesia or New Zealand when it's time to go home. Now, obviously that all depends on where you live. If you're from the U you know, New Zealand then happy days, but if you're from the UK and you're leaving in New Zealand, then you've got a big trip, right? Now, the longest trip I ever made was from Fiji to UK. The trip consisted of a 45 minute boat ride in which the chief officer was also leaving with me but decided he wanted to drive the boat was driving like we were doing a car chase from a movie then a 45 minute drive in a pickup truck uh, off road uh, to a local airstrip strip not port um, and then we flew on a twin otter uh, to suva the main island and then the actual trip home started that was just to get us to the airport and then we flew from, um, I think we had a flight to New Zealand from there, and then New Zealand to Hong Kong, which is like a 12 hour flight, and then Hong Kong to the UK, which is another 10 hours, I think, something like that. Total, the total trip from start to end was 48 hours. All right, so that's how it will most likely go from the interview process to the end of your first rotation. Hopefully you won't have the issue with the pay like I described in the middle there. Now, this kind of life is not for everyone. You have very little privacy. You're sharing a cabin, sharing a bathroom. You'll work longer hours, especially when the owner's on board, you'll get very little time off during these periods. And you'll have a rather strict working environment. Unless you've been in the military, uh, it will seem not that strict. If you've not been in the military, you probably feel like it's quite strict. Master at arms, take that man below and clap him in irons. Working on a yacht is working and living in a hierarchy very similar to the military, just without people shooting at you and stuff like that. But you will get well paid, especially if you're a young deckhand. You know, and most 21 year old people are probably still living with their parents. They have very little outgoings, very good uh, salary for, for a young person, especially with if you haven't got that many qualifications because you're just starting out, right? You'll get to travel all around the world on someone else's dime, which is, for me, has always been the best thing about it you'll get a chance to explore when the yacht is laid up. So if the if the owner wants you in Tahiti and then he, he travels to Tahiti, does a few weeks, then he leaves, the boat's laid up there, you'll get to do your exploring once he's gone home. And you'll get an experience pretty much like no other. And you'll fall in love with the ocean. And that's something that will never leave you. <laughs> Jacques Cousteau once said, the sea, once it casts its spell, holds you in its net of wonder forever.